This is the GTN Show, welcome. This week, I'm gonna be delving into that mass start debate after a rather significant disqualification over the weekend. Of course, I'm gonna be looking at the exciting results from the grand final down under. We've also got Question Time, our new feature. I'm gonna be sharing a lot of the photos that you guys have sent in from your various competitions and training. And how could I forget, we have plenty of very lucky giveaway winners to announce. Well, as you can see, I'm on my own again, and I know a few of you have got a little bit concerned that Mark and I might have fallen out. But don't worry, we haven't. We are gonna be back together again soon. But Mark's quite busy, and I think we might actually just hear from him now. Hi, guys. Yes, I'm away again, but I am busy at work. I've flown out to Germany. It's early in the morning here. It's the Rhine River, just here, about an hour from Frankfurt. I am gonna be popping up a little bit later in the show and giving you a bit of a clue as to where I am and some of those exciting videos that are coming in the next couple of weeks. Right, well I guess it's only fair that Mark's out this week because admittedly I was out last week at the very exciting launch of the new Polar Vantage V and I did get the chance to catch up with a couple of polar athletes whilst I was there and it got me thinking I wanted to do a triathlete versus runner. So let's see how the sports compare. First question, how many miles a week do you run in normal, like in your main training season, Ailish? Uh, 45. I'm a kilometres girl, probably about 105 kilometres. Oh, that's disgusting. That's <laughs> so far. How many hours of training do you do a day? Um, it works out about probably two hours a day. Probably about six. <laughs> How many gym or S&C sessions do you do? Start with Emma. Um, so two like main ones. Um, and then uh, I like to include yoga in that for two weeks as well. How many meals and snacks do you have a day? Like non-stop, I think it's just continuous. Um, I'd have three proper main meals a day, and then yeah, just continuous snack. Yeah, probably four uh, light meals, and then yeah, as many Harry Bow as the <laughs> shop stack. How many hours sleep a night, Emma? Uh, aim for eight. I like hibernating, so I would easily sleep anywhere between eight to 10 every night. When um, and how many naps or how long would you rest in the day? During hard training blocks, I'll nap pretty much every day. Once a week if I'm lucky. Oh. Okay, standard breakfast. Porridge, I'm obsessed with porridge. Yeah, sometimes I have porridge, I go over <laughs> late in that one and I add egg in. Um, or oh. poached egg on toast. That's but it's one. really nice, don't knock it. Salt, pepper, egg, porridge. Um, which sport do you guys think is harder? Pure running or triathlon? Uh, triathlon is a lot more time like that. I don't know how you can train for that long. Maybe the intensity of running is maybe chance of getting injured, things like that is maybe a little bit more difficult. But yeah, the actual time and effort of just constantly training, triathlon, hands down. Yeah, I'd go with, with triathlon um, time-wise, like endure, the mentality of just that constant slog. It's like yeah. the endurance thing, but pain-wise, yeah. Throwing up after a track session, I'd say <laughs> running is pain-wise. Well, that's an interesting comparison, but I'm guessing you guys are probably slightly biased and they're gonna think that triathlon is not only better, but also harder than running. But do let me know in the comments section below what you think. I'll come on to the race news very shortly, but it was a situation in the swim on the weekend that caught my eye. It was much to the disappointment for the British team that Alistair Brownlee got disqualified in the ITU Grand Final down under as a result of going the wrong side of a swim boy marker. Well, Alistair says he's really disappointed with the day, his first ever disqualification in a sporting event from being on the wrong side, but he's obviously not debating it. Said he was disorientated after getting held under the water in the roughest swim that he's ever done. Well, the swimming conditions on the Gold Coast did look pretty tough and choppy. And then you add to that the fact that you've got 60 of the top best athletes in the world for both the men's and the women's race. And from the film shots, we could see it did look like a pretty much a washing machine effect. And I can't imagine what it actually felt like to be in there. And now for Alistair, he's not had the most consistent season, so he didn't have a preferable starting position on the pond which meant that he was slightly further back than he'd want to be. And when you get to that first boy marker, it really did look like it was just a fight as everyone funneled in to get around that small angle. Initially, Alistair was given a 15 second penalty and then that was increased to a full disqualification, but both him and the British team decided that they weren't going to appeal. But you tend to not see this problem as much when you get to the longer distance pro racing, partly because the fields do tend to be a little bit smaller, but also the pace is a little bit less ferocious at the start because it's a longer distance race. Although that said, in age group racing, you can see hundreds and hundreds of athletes all starting together. And sometimes as well, you'll get some weaker swimmers. So it's been interesting to see over the last few 
few years at Ironman have introduced the rolling start, but it has come at a mixed reception. Well, the first Ironman that I actually competed in last year in South Africa employed the rolling start situation, and they did seven athletes going every seven seconds. So it meant that you could get into your own rhythm and you weren't being bombarded by a lot of athletes around you. But then that said, I had the complete contrast because my next Ironman I did was the World Championships in Kona, and I had a mass start with over 800 women. So it was really one extreme to the other. If you're an age grouper in ITU racing, you'll be used to the mass start because they normally have a whole age group starting or sometimes even two age groups together. And it can get pretty tight on the pontoon to find a space as I found out in Glasgow, we're all completely jammed in. But then if it's a championship race, surely that's how it should be because it is a mass start, it is one race. And if it's a draft legal event, then obviously it has to be. So does introducing a rolling start just make the swim easier? And is that then unfair on those stronger swimmers? Well, let's have a look at the pros and the cons. Right, let's start with the pros. First up, the fact it's gonna be safer and more encouraging to the new triathletes. Secondly, it's easier to swim your own race and do your own pacing, because you're not gonna be influenced by a big group around you. And talking of a big group, it does actually spread the field out that bit more, so when you come onto the bike for the non-drafting races, there's less likely to have any pace lines or packs forming, so does that make it more fair? And then finally, Finally, for organizers especially, you don't need to have such a huge pontoon or a large area for the start. As rolling, you can just have seven or 10 athletes going in at once. But then on the flip side, the cons, a lot of people say, well, is it unfair on the strong swimmers? Because you know you need to be a strong swimmer and you're gonna have more of an advantage in a mass start. Also, it is a tradition to triathlon. A lot of people would say, you know, you start off all together in a race. Triathlon, after all, is a race, so surely it should start like that. And then finally, when you're actually an athlete in it, how do you know how you're doing in your race compared to your fellow competitors? And the same goes for spectators and for media following. It's really hard to tell if you all started at different places. So that, I mean, is a debate that I think will be ongoing and it's a really hard one to answer. So I want your help this week for the GTM poll. I'm gonna ask you, do you think that all age group non-drafting triathlon races should have a rolling start? Simple, yes or no. Just click on the link above my head to enter the poll. And now let's have a look at the results from last week's GTM poll. So I'm just gonna grab my laptop. Mark asked you, what do you think about whilst you're racing? And the results are in. Um, fourth place, it was other with 7%. Next up, do you distract yourself? That was 15% of people. 30% um, said they embrace the pain. And a big 48% of you, which was actually Mark and myself included, break the race down into chunks. And I personally obviously think that's the best way to deal with it. But interesting to hear nonetheless. Anyway, now we are moving on to an exciting part because it is the giveaway winners to announce. And first up, we have the Roka sunglasses unboxing with a chance to win the GP1X or the CP1X. And you guys, you winners, get to choose your model and your color. So enough suspense, I think. Let's read out the winners. We have Arthur Gramatico, Dimitri Chanov, Patrick Mayer and Daniel Blomkis. Now guys, don't worry, we will be in touch with an email to then find out exactly what models you want of your Roka sunglasses. Incredibly jealous of those. Next up, we've got the winners for the On Running Cloud Ace giveaway. And first up, we have Harold Carrion, Alexander Ribolov, Gian Ha and Helen Morgan. You guys have all got a pair of Cloud Ace shoes on their way to you. You just need to wait for the email from us. And finally, we've got one more set of giveaways to announce and it is for the fan kit jersey. And the lucky winner is Richard Lin. Hey, it's me again. Now, when I said I was gonna give you a bit of a clue as to where I am, I'm probably making it quite obvious now. Yeah, I'm beside Patrick Langer's 2017 Ironman World Championship winning bike. I've also got Naira Quintana's bike behind me. I'm just surrounded by amazing pro bikes. It's been incredible just seeing these bikes up close in person. We have got a couple of really exciting videos coming from this trip over the next few weeks. So do stay tuned for those videos soon. It's question time. Last week, Mark answered some of the questions that you guys have left below our videos and addressed some of the comments. So I think we should take a look at what we've had this week. 
Well, starting off, we can't ignore Polar. We've had a couple of Polar videos go out in the last week and we've had lots of questions and comments on these videos. So a quick question here from the unboxing came in from Louis B. Maybe I missed it, but I haven't seen any info about the screen material. Is it plastic or glass? And if glass, is it Gorilla Glass? Well, Louis, the answer is yes. This is 100% Gorilla Glass and very tough. I think it could take more than just a nail tapping on it somehow. Well, next we have a few more comments from our Polar Watch comparison video, including this one here from Edwin van Kleempunt says, can I swim with my Polar M430? Edwin, the answer is yes. And until I got this Vantage V last week, I actually use the M430 all the time. And as you probably know, I do quite a lot of swimming. Admittedly in the pool, it won't actually count your legs for you. So you'll have to do that, but it will record your time. And when it comes to open water, it can record your distance as well. Well, there's another comment here that caught my eye. This one was a video from the previous week on the running skills video that I made when I talked about skipping. Now it comes in from Russell. Is skipping in the UK jumping rope in the USA? Well, I must admit, Russell, that I didn't actually know what jumping rope was and never heard of it. A bit like it seems some of you guys had never heard or knew what I was talking about was skipping. So I've done a little bit of research and from my interpretation, I think jump rope is what I guess when you add in some tricks. So I'm intrigued by this and having had a little look on YouTube, I think it's time I went and had a go to see if I could do this at all. Okay, just been checking this out and I didn't realize this is what I've let myself in for because I'm not sure I'm ready to do jump rope. Okay, I'm gonna start off and see how far we get with this. Okay. This is after lunch as well, so bear with me here. All right, I'm gonna see if I can do a cross. Ah, <laughs> oh, I so used to be able to do this, I promise. But it was at primary school, so quite a few years ago. Come on, come on, I can. Third time lucky, concentrate, Heather. All right, see if I can go the other way with my hands. That's much harder than I expected. I'm actually still out of breath, but that in my mind is a trick, even if you guys don't think so. So I'm gonna leave it on that note. Right, I think I'm better off leaving that to the experts somehow, but I think it's time to move on to some news. First up, we've got some news from the Ironman Foundation and the Women for Tri program, which has been designed to get more women into triathlon, has just announced that they have 500 more slots for women to race at the Ironman 70.3 World Championships, which are gonna be held in Nice in France in September next year, 2019. Now this got launched actually last weekend at the 70.3 Nice Ironman competition. And all the proceeds from these extra slots are actually gonna go back into the Women for Tri program, encouraging more athletes or more female athletes to get involved in the sport. The next piece of news made me chuckle when I saw it. It's a triathlete eating too much. Now, Jaroslav Bobrovsky used to be a bodybuilder. He's now become a triathlete, lives in Bavaria and enjoys his sushi. Now, his local sushi restaurant, ironically named Running Sushi, has an all-you-can-eat sushi night where he pays his 15 euros and then rocks up and eats as much as he can. Apparently, sometimes as many as 100 plates of sushi are consumed by Jaroslav. Now, the restaurant owner has brought this up with him before and said, you know, you, you're you sort of, it's on the verge of actually being a little bit too much. And he's now had to go to the extent of banning Jaroslav Bobrovsky from the restaurant because he says he eats too much. All right, this next bit of news is a bit more serious, but still very exciting because we have a brand new world record for the marathon. It was set at the Berlin Marathon over the weekend. And this record had previously stood for the last four years, set in Berlin in 2014. But it's Eliud Kipchoge who recorded a time of two hours, one minute and 39 seconds to break that four year record by a massive one minute and 20 seconds. And it just gets you thinking, is that two hour margin actually going to be breakable it is very exciting to watch and such a huge chunk off the record as well it's time for the race news and all eyes were on the Gold Coast in Australia over the weekend as it was the ITU World Triathlon Grand Final where the World Triathlon Series overall winners would be decided. But on top of that, there were another 19 professional world titles up for grabs. And add to that, you also got it doubling up as a world championship for the age group sprint and Olympic distance triathlon. So as you can imagine, there were a lot of races and a lot of world titles, a few too many for us to go into 
into detail on all of them. So today I'm going to focus on the very exciting elite races that would decide the World Triathlon Series winner as well as the Grand Final winner. Well, on the women's side, the biggest battle was going to be for the World Triathlon Series overall world champion winner, and that was between Katie Seferis and Vicky Holland. Now, Seferis has actually been top of the rankings for the whole season, but Holland has had a very strong finish to her season and has actually whittled that gap down to just 34 points, meaning that whoever won between those two would actually get the overall title. So the battle was set, and under the swim, Holland had a very good start to the day. She actually came out towards the front of the pack. There were 58 athletes in this women's pro field, and onto the bike, they actually broke away first initially into a group of just five. So Holland had her teammate, Jess Learmont. Katie Zaveres was obviously in that group as well. She was joined by her teammate, Kirsten Casper. And then another three joined them to make a group of eight, but they weren't able to keep the chase pack away. So by the halfway mark, the chase pack had caught them and it ended up being a group of 29 as they headed into T2. Well, heading out onto the run, it was Katie Zaveres and Ashley Gentle who actually took the initial lead. Holland was with them and she dropped back and it looked for a moment as though she could actually be out of the running, but somehow she managed to close that gap again. And I think Zaveres might have gone a little bit too hard too soon because then it was Gentle and Holland who opened up a gap as Zaveres dropped off. And these two ran neck and neck for the final few K and it came into a sprint finish. And it seemed like the home crowd just gave Ashley Gentle that extra advantage and she managed to out sprint Holland to take the grand final title. Holland finished second and Katie Severo's third in the grand final, but that meant the overall World Triathlon Series title went to Vicky Holland and it was second place to Katie Severo's and then it was Brit Georgia Taylor Brown who finished third in the overall standings. Well, in the men's race, it was very much a battle for the grand final title as Mario Mola had so many points that as long as he finished 14th or higher, he was going to take the overall title. So a field of 65 men in the swim, it was pretty chaotic as we've already touched on with Alistair. So some disappointment there for him. But the swim was led out by Richard Varga, although no real significant breakaway until onto the bike, a group of five athletes formed at the front, including Richard Varga, Henry Schumann, Vincent Louis and Johnny Brownlee. But then at the 10K mark, it was Vincent Louis who had a little slip on the corner, came off his bike, was okay, but it did just mean they lost their momentum and it allowed the chasing pack to make a move and actually catch up the leading five. But meanwhile, during that slip up, it was Martin Van Riel who was the fifth member of that group of five actually, made a breakaway up the road and it looked like the chase pack weren't gonna do much about it and they let him go until Christian Blumenfeld decided he wanted to make a break, no one was gonna go with him. So he managed to join Martin Van Riel up the road and those two worked together for the last 5K. But Van Riel actually had a mechanical just a K towards the end of the bike, so lost all of that advantage. And that left Christian Blumenfeld coming into T2 with a 35 second advantage as he headed out onto the run, but there was a serious big pack behind him full of very fast runners indeed. And it didn't take long for that gap to soon be whittled down. Well, that group did include the likes of Mario Mola, Jacob Burtwistle, Richard Murray, Henry Schumann, Van St. Louis, so some pretty fast runners. And then they ran together for a little bit until two and a half K to go. And Van St. Louis made a very bold, brave move and broke away from Mario Mola. And Mario Mola couldn't do anything about it. Van St. Louis ran the rest of the race by himself to take the clear victory for the grand final title. Mario Mola crossed the line in second, so obviously securing his World Triathlon Series overall victory. And then third place in the grand final was Richard Murray. Well, that meant in the overall standings, obviously, we had Mola on top by a very clear margin. Van St. Louis had moved up into second place in the overall standings as a result of that win. And then third place went to Australia's Jacob Burtwistle on home soil. It's now time for the caption competition. And last week we had this photo from the Ironman 70.3 Worlds. And as always, we had some pretty cool suggestions. So to start us off, we have this one from Christopher Bornham. Good grief, PE has big birds. Caption from Eric Forbes. Looks like someone put a bit too much sealant in his tires. Yeah, a little bit of spillage going on. Uh, Stephen Reeves, that's one way to take care of a wheel sucker. But our winner this week goes to George. George, if you get in touch, we will send you a GTN cap for this caption. Drafting those seagulls does have its consequences. I like it. Anyway, moving on to this week for your chance to win a cap. We have this picture here from the ITU Grand Final down under in Australia. Now, I'm not sure the athletes were horsing around. 
you guys could do much better than that, I am sure. So do let us know, send in your captions in the comments section below. Right, it's time to have a look at some of your photos and share them with you guys. So we're gonna start with what I'm calling bike inspiration. It's pretty inspirational, some of these photos, especially this first one that has been sent in by Steve and it's his felt A16 from Richmond, Virginia, USA. And he says, I've never been much of a morning person, but sunrises like this make it absolutely worth it. I am completely with you, Steve, because I am not a morning person, but when you do get to see a beautiful sunrise, you just think, I need to get up early more often. A stunning photo, so thank you for sharing that one with us. I wanna get up early and go on my bike tomorrow. Probably won't happen, but the thought is there. Our next one, though, is a little bit on the other end of the spectrum. This comes in from James, and it's his Cervelo S5. Ironically, from the Sunshine Coast in Australia, it says it's his first triathlon. 2018 Sunshine Coast Ironman 70.3. That looks really tough, but well done to you, James, for doing your first triathlon. Hopefully, it's not put you off either. Right, now we are going to move to the pain cave. And we've got this one that's been sent in from Louis. And it is his Giant Propel Advanced Pro Shimano with Ultegra 6800 Osymmetric Chain Rings. Also, if you look in the background, apparently he's currently restoring an old Peugeot road bike to make his favorite commuter. A nice pain cave setup. And our final one, the final photo we're gonna share with you today is from a, a running picture, but a little bit different because it's not pure running, it is the transition. This has been sent in by Ali. He says, dancing around, uh, around the run, having perfectly paced the swim and the bike. Well, I don't think he's quite paced the bike perfectly yet because it looks like he's coming out of the swim, but interesting one, Ali. So hopefully it sounds like you had a great race and great to see you looking so happy in the middle of a race as well. And as I've mentioned before, we do obviously love looking at your photos and then sharing them back with you. So make sure you keep sending them in by using our uploader. And in particular, I would love to see more of your running photos and swimming photos before the season comes to an end. And if you are racing this weekend, for example, I know we're getting towards the end of the season here in the Northern Hemisphere, but if you've set up your transition zone and you're really proud of it, then take a photo and send it in to us. Well, that is it. And hopefully next week, Mark and I will actually be back together to prove that everything is cool here at GTN HQ. If you've enjoyed this and you wanna get all of our videos from GTN, hit the globe to subscribe. Now, if you wanna see a video that I made just recently on our top five supplements that could help you as a triathlete, that video is just here. And if having watched this, you've got really envious of all of these giveaway winners, well, you'll be pleased to know that there is still a chance for you guys to get your hands on your very own Polar watch. So if you watch the Polar unboxing video here, you can see how you can get your hands on one.